Welcome to my 100,000 subscriber special. I've been planning this video for a very long time and I can't believe it's already here. I can't believe I'm here at all. So I've packed a lot into tonight's video. But before we get into all that, I see a reoccurring theme, a common theme amongst many of the comments in my videos. People say they learn a lot from them and they're very informative. Well, that's a two-way street. I read all of the comments. And I've learned so many things from the comments, whether it's how something is supposed to come apart or why something is designed some way or the origin of one engine or family of engines. There's so much information in the comments. I feel like I've learned more from you than you could ever have learned from me. So thank you for that. But tonight's video is not going to be a normal Saturday night video. But before you get too upset, we're still going to take an engine apart. There's still a teardown. I would never deprive you of your weekend teardown. There's also going to be a shop tour. You guys have been begging me to see the inside of my shop, so I'm going to show you everything, including the cars you see in the background of many of those videos. We're also going to take a lot tour. You'll get to see some of my inventory, some of my parts cars, and then some other projects that I will get to some other day. We'll also talk about the backside of the channel, how it operates, you'll get to meet my family, and then what's in store for this channel in the future. What will never change, what will change, some things you can expect to see, Anyway, I hope you enjoy this video, and I'll catch you on the next one. I, I can't believe I'm actually making a video on this. I can't believe this is actually a thing. I hit 100,000 subscribers. And I, I'm still not quite sure how or why, but I did. And I know everyone makes comments that I deserve it, but it doesn't feel like it. It feels like I, I, I won the lottery. I'm incredibly grateful and uh, I'm not quite sure what I've done to deserve this, but I just keep my head down and continue doing things that I normally do with a camera in front of me. That's pretty much it. And this channel was never designed for this. This was never supposed to be this big, ever. It was supposed to be a platform for me to show people how to do things and the things that I do on my own projects, kind of give some inspiration to people, and help people out on topics that weren't really covered, at least not all in one place. like my LS swapped Land Cruiser. Whole goal of that project was so that someone isn't so overwhelmed with a giant project like that. So that someone can do that without having to do all the research. They can watch 12 videos and get the majority of it done. I also wanted to show what it takes to fix some wrecked cars and some of the other dumb projects I've had, but it was never, never supposed to be this big. And I am so grateful that it is. It's allowed me to do things that I never thought I could do. Although it does take quite a bit of work. So I, I cannot thank my viewers, my fans, the subscribers enough. This is just, it's incredible really. I, one year ago, one year ago, February of 2021, I hit 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours, which is the requirements to get monetized. And I initially thought when I made it to that point that, you know, if I make like five bucks a day, 10 bucks a day, that would pretty much pay for gas and that would be awesome. And um, that's how it was for a very short time. And now it's grown into something that is, <laughs> it's got a lot of steam, it's got a lot of momentum, and I'm excited to see where this channel goes in the future. Now. For my 100,000 subscriber special, I figured I'd pick an engine that I get asked for in nearly every single video I post. This is not something I'd normally get in here, but thanks to my good friend Steven, I now have a Chevrolet 350 V8 to take apart on the channel. I, I, I know, I know, Thank you. you're welcome, you're welcome. Some old school iron. This isn't something that would normally come through the doors here. I don't think I've ever had anything carbureted through the shop. It's probably nothing that'll happen again, but for today, we get to take apart an old 350. Now, I, I don't suspect this teardown is gonna take very long. I guess they are that easy. I kid, I kid. We're gonna take this engine completely apart. You guys are gonna be along with me for every single step, all 17 seconds. All right, it's really gonna take like 15 minutes and I'm not exaggerating. There's really not much to this. And now this engine, I do have a story with. Most of the engines that come in, I don't know miles, okay, I don't know miles on this, but I don't know any details whatsoever. But this engine is a running engine out of a Jeep, obviously not originally and it burned a ton of oil. It leaked a ton of oil. It's just a tired old engine. So I don't know if we're gonna find anything catastrophic inside. Don't wanna keep your hopes up, but it's the small block. So it's probably repairable. Now this engine does have a couple of aftermarket parts on it. It has one of two Edelbrock chrome valve covers 
I think my buddy kept the other one. It has an Edelbrock Performer aluminum intake, a 2101, and an Edelbrock 600 manual choke carburetor. And otherwise, this is just a standard small block. But before we take this thing apart, let's see if we can decode it and figure out what it originally came in. Before I go and decode this, uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I just did a few minutes of research to tell you this, but the stamping on the pad in front of the passenger cylinder head says V0206 TKT. From my understanding, that's Flint, Michigan, which is V0206 is February 6th, and TKT is what the engine came from, which is either a 74, a 78, or an 80 Chevrolet square body truck, and it's a 165 horsepower version. This is a pretty run-of-the-mill small block from that era. The very first thing we're going to do is not pull plugs because they're gone. But we're going to pull the intake manifold and carb. And we're going to try to do that without pulling the carb off the intake. I, I know it's just four bolts, but I'm going to sell it together, so I'm going to leave it together. I am going to hang on to all the hardware from this engine. this in here. I don't think I can. No. Well, it would help if I went the right way too. Come on, get in there. Uh oh, I'm gonna, oh, what did I do that for? Well, looks like I gotta pull the carb anyway. All right, carb's coming off. I don't know why. Should have just pulled it from the very beginning. I'm stubborn though. Alright, there's the carb. And then that comes right out. Boy, I should have done that in the very beginning. Well, let's see how hard this intake is to get off. Oh yeah, it's gonna take a little effort, I'm sure. Oh, blue, probably ought to take that valve cover off. I'm doing everything in the wrong order today. Some kind of rinky-dink hardware here. But it's coming off. Something I learned from working on these engines, and yes, I've had a couple vehicles with small blocks in them. I had a 73 Corvette, which I shouldn't have sold, and I had a 67 Impala, which I'm glad I did. Both of those had small blocks in them, and both of them had oil leaks from the valve cover gaskets. And beside the fact that they use cork gaskets, the mating surface for the gasket isn't machined. It's just cast. It just seems a lot harder to get something that's not leak when the surface isn't machined. All right, I think once we break the seal, it won't be so bad. But until then, yeah, I can hear that sound. It's getting there. Old blue to the rescue. Come on now. And we're off. Well, the first thing that caught my eye is this little science experiment in the cooling passage. I don't know why I always touch these things. At least I'm wearing gloves this time. Has the Edelbrock gaskets. I don't see any other issues in here, but again, the only thing you'd really see in this is bent push rods, or if the engine came completely apart. The next thing we're gonna do is crack the rockers loose so that we can pull the push rods out and then we'll put the rockers back on and leave them with the head. Right, let's go ahead and get these lifters out. Come on. All right, that's a later problem. Now these are flat tappet lifters. This is not a roller motor. Come on, weak magnet. <sighs> Frustration. 
Alright, well this is going to be a challenge. I might just pull those once we get the head off. Alright, I have no idea if this is going to make any good sounds. Or not. I have no idea. Now, this head should come right off. And I know it's gonna be heavy. But it also has to come off still. What the heck? Oh, blue! Well, the first thing that I saw was 060 stamped on the piston which probably means these are 60 over pistons, which means this engine's been gone through before. Not really surprising for as old as this engine is, but look how shiny that piston is. And that one's a little less shiny, and those two are looking the way I'd suspect they would look out of this engine, but I'm gonna go look at the head gasket, because I bet there's gonna be a problem. Oh, I think there's a problem. Head gasket's coming apart. I bet this thing got hot a couple times. Yeah, I don't really see any like major issues. I don't know if that's a crack or not. That might be a crack. Actually, I think that's a crack. That sure looks like a crack to me. Maybe a couple. So this thing likely was overheated. The bores don't look so hot either. Pretty worn here. Definitely set with some moisture in it. I don't know, it's pretty pitted. I don't have a crank bolt to turn this thing over, so we're gonna have to wait till we get all this apart to see what the rest of these bores look like. No. Where did you go? Okay, let go. Oh, whatever, we'll just do it that way. That was way easier. Why didn't I do that from all of them? Why did I wait till the last one? There's the push rods from the driver's side. From the passenger side. There's definitely some pitting on them. I'm not sure how long this engine was out of the vehicle. Or if it sat around, or maybe it was exposed to moisture at some point. But, none of them are bent. I know the camera might make them look that way, but that's just the shades from my lighting in here. Alright, time for some snap crackle and pop. Let's get Old Blue to get this head off here for us. Okay. Stuck on a dowel. What 
Well, this side looks much better. Till we get here. And there's a little bit of rust around there. This doesn't really have a ridge. It's not too bad. I've seen them much worse than this. Especially on older engines like this. Some vertical scratches. It's not too bad though over here. The head looks much better as well. Head gasket looks better. Everything looks better on this side. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and get this crank pulley off. This puller has never seen any abuse, ever. All right, let's get the rest of these lifters out of here. Ooh, that bore was a little tight. Oh man. I'll show you that in a minute. But you got damage. Come back here. It's supposed to come out all nice and easy like that. Got two damaged. Okay, I got two damaged lifters. Let's go check these out. So you can see a distinct difference between these three lifters, which popped right out of the bore with no issue, and these two lifters. See how that is caved in, it's uneven, and it's actually mushroomed out on the outside, which is why they were a little tighter in the bore. It took a little more effort to get them out of the block. I think we're gonna find some cam damage. All right, this is going to be a struggle because this socket doesn't like fitting on these, but we'll get it. All right, let's get this timing cover off here. All right, so now I'm going to get cam gear off and we'll slide that cam out. The chain looks pretty good. Not a ton of wear on the teeth. Let's go ahead and get that apart. All right, let's get this cam out of here. Oh yeah. I can't tell if that's a factory cam or not. I don't even know what I'm looking at. I know it's a camshaft. So here's the cam out of that. And remember, two lifters were in really bad shape. And take a look at this lobe here. Look at that. See this lifter, it's supposed to be flat. Not dished. And look at the shape of that lobe. The same is true down here. That cam lobe right there. Got a bad cam, two bad lifters. Yeah, it's just, just burn some oil. It's fine. Hey, I didn't pay anything for this. Can't even begin to be mad here. Still owe him a beer. All right, now it's time to flip this thing over. If we can. Yeah, we can. Is it going to puke? a little coolant not too shabby just a little more coolant still not too shabby at this point we can tell this is an old rebuilt engine it's been painted black it's been painted blue you can see a little bit of the orange still coming through and there's a heat tab on that freeze plug right there and the center's melted out let's go ahead and get this pan out of here
Well, the inside of that pan has a bunch of debris. Not looking so hot. No identifiable pieces yet. And then there's a bunch of chunks on the screen and on the pickup. And then I'm gonna struggle to call that oil. It's probably a mixture of everything that's inside this engine, gas, coolant, and oil. And everything else seems to look okay. It's about time we start getting the rods and pistons up, but first we gotta get the oil pump and pickup out of the way when we're almost done. Well, there goes the oil pump drive. Here's the oil pump and the oil pump drive, just like so. And it's driven off the base of the distributor, which is turned by the cam. Let's start at the back and work our way up. Oh, oh, that's not good. Will this come down on the bore easily, please? Okay. It's now at the top of the bore, and I don't know if I can get it any further. We're slowly figuring this out here. You know, this is some state-of-the-art technology, and there's a little bit of a learning curve here. Oh, that's that's not good either. Does not feel so good in the bore. All right, let's see if we can turn this over by hand now. We can kind of do that. Not the direction I want to. So let's, let's get our adjustment tool here. Whoa there, getting a little spicy. There we are. Are we any better now? Let's see. N not really. A little bit of carbon up there, probably doing that. Ooh, we are not going anywhere. Oh, we'll go. We'll, we'll take that up a notch. Now we're moving. A little rusty. That's why. I don't want to shoot it at the floor. I know a lot of you guys use kitty litter to soak up your oil. We don't do that anymore. That's too messy. We use pig mats. We've been doing this for a few years now, ever since I bought the shop. No dust. It's just so much easier and quicker. You don't have to wait for it to soak in. Somebody ought to move that oil pan. It's dangerous. Not yet. I dropped it anyway. Okay, let's see if it turns over even easier now. Careful not to chop my fingers off.
Whoa now. All right, last and least. This is because it's cylinder number one. Slowest number. It's a joke. I've got all the rods and pistons out now. And the pistons actually don't look too bad. There's some scoring on the sides, but it's really not bad. I didn't see any damage really. Rods look good. Now one thing to note is look at the surface finish where the bearing sits. It doesn't look like normal rods, and that's because these bearings, it's got Clevite 77s in it, and that crank has been ground 010. These are not standard size bearings, which means that these rods were run through a machine to hone the inside of the rod to make sure it's round. And the bearings are still very worn. And as you get further towards the back of the engine, you can see there are more and more damage. This one's really torn up. There's another one that's really bad. See, it's through several layers of metal on some of these cylinders. So just a tired, remanufactured engine or rebuilt engine. I also wanted to look at the crank here. If you look, there's a ton of marks on this crank. Do you think this crank is from a different engine? Maybe it suffered a uh, catastrophic failure, but the journals were nice enough to use. I've just I've never seen a counterweight look like that unless it went through a storm of stuff. All right, and finally, let's pull the crank. doesn't really fight you at all. Plop this crank out of here. This has some strange wear on the main bearings, like it's through the metal on one side of the top bearing and the bottom bearing. They all look pretty rough. Not like it's spun anything, but it's still not great. The crank definitely has some wear on all of the journals. It would likely need to be turned again if there's even enough material there. It's pretty worn out. Well, none of these bores look outstanding. They all have some vertical scratches, pretty shiny and glazed, not a lot of the cross hatching still visible. And this was the side that had the blown head gasket. That cylinder's pretty rough. I was chewing on some coolant for a while. A lot of this stuff you can feel with your fingernail. Well, that was a lot worse than I anticipated, but it is an old engine. It's been rebuilt. Uh, the size of the rods were actually stamped with the number for each cylinder they were supposed to go in. I'm pretty sure GM didn't do that. Uh, and it definitely has been machined. It's, been, it's 60 over, the crank's been turned. I mean, who knows what else has been done to that engine? And who knows how long ago that was? That could have been 35 years ago. We really don't know. All things considered, that was a great teardown. It was a lot of fun working on some old stuff like that. I, it's so simple, it like, I get to a step and I can't believe I'm, I'm there. I can't believe I'm done. Oh, and everybody keeps asking about this Jeep. It's just a Grand Cherokee. Okay, it's not a 5.9. Someone put a 5.9 hood and a 5.9 grill on a 5.2 truck. Now, we use this as a test mule. This Jeep has had at least 100, okay, at least 1,000 computers plugged into it. I test all kinds of things with it, and it still runs and drives. I could drive it home if I wanted to. I actually swapped the interior from tan to black. The interior was really rough, and I found a really nice black interior in the junkyard. I swapped them out because I don't know why. I just do things stupid. I don't understand why I do this stuff. Time for another shameless plug. 
Important part is the business I own and run. We're a full service auto dismantler. We go to the auction, we buy cars that we know we can part out, we part them out and sell the parts on the internet. We pretty much do specialty vehicles, not exotics, but specialty vehicles. I buy a lot of C5 Corvettes, a lot of Miatas, uh, a lot of BMWs. I know you guys are all surprised about that. A lot of Chevy trucks. I don't just do import parts, it's kind of where we started, but now we do imports and domestics. Uh, I also have an in-house electronic repair team. Uh, Pro Rebuild is kind of a subsidiary I started a few years ago. We saw a lot of obsolete parts you can't even buy at the dealership. A lot of GM anti-theft modules, uh, a lot of climate controls, gauge clusters. Uh, I even do like parking brake modules and some amplifiers, all kinds of stuff. I got about eh, five or six hundred different types of parts that we run through that part of the shop. And uh, we also do a lot of Chrysler computers, a lot of Chrysler engine control modules. We sell them pre-programmed. I can do off-car programming, so when you buy them from me, they are plug and play. I have test vehicles here on the lot, so I can verify what I sell is good. All right, I'm done with this commercial. This is a tough commercial. It's my own business. Welcome to Import Apart. We don't sell cats here. If you'd like one of those signs, just send me an email. I've got several. Here's my lobby where people buy parts, my favorite poster. This is where people pass the time waiting for their parts to be pulled. Chairs out of my grandfather's gas station from the 60s. Of course, my collection of broken and destroyed engine parts. Let's go and check out some of the offices. Here's my inventory and listing office. This is where everything gets added that's up for sale. And here's my office. This is where all the cars are purchased and all the stress is. It's not really that bad. I still have some work to do. Maybe a proper door handle might be on order. Still have to put a whiteboard in here and maybe decorate it, make it, make it look like I want to be in here. I do like this office a lot. All right, let's check out the rest of the shop. It seems so big at first, but I promise this place is full. I am out of space. Here is my shipping department. We're actually trying to get away from using packing peanuts. Too messy. And here is where I do a lot of programming before parts get shipped. We do a lot of off-car programming on Chrysler computers. This place has a little bit of power too. Here is some of our inventory. All of our Chrysler computers. We sell all of these Chrysler PCMs pre-programmed, plug and play. I'm actually kind of running low. It's getting a little hard to find. All the boxes you see, these are things we pre-pack. So when we're slow, we pack up the things that take a lot of time to ship. That way, if somebody wants to buy it and we need to ship it out the same day, it's just a matter of slapping a label on it. It's all about time management. Some of our other parts, more Chrysler PCMs, and our headlights. Some turbos, cooling fans, brake calipers, we do lots of big brakes here. Brand specific areas, so everything from each brand will be on the same shelf, typically speaking, unless somebody puts something in the wrong shelf, which I can already see that. I'm just going to pretend I didn't. 
Here's my street sweeper. That was a co-part purchase. Didn't run. I had to fix the starter and then it fired right up. And then I, um, yeah, I blew the drive unit apart trying to do donuts in it. So if there's one of these at your work and you try to do donuts in it, it will cost you $1,000 or like $970. Would not recommend. Zero out of ten. Here's my old forklift. This is the only forklift I still have from my old shop. It's a 1969 Caterpillar. And fun fact, this thing will only leak oil if it has oil. So if you don't put oil in it, it doesn't leak. So we don't. And my rear end rack. Got a couple of those, but that's the only one that's up currently. And um, my Austin Powers cart. It's broken. It makes me sad. It doesn't go forward, just backwards. Here's some of my drivetrain inventory. Engines, transmissions, differentials. Got some 5.7 Hemis over here, a lot of BMW stuff. Got some uh, N54s. 6.1 Hemi pullout. Got an S54 out of an O2 M3. Parts everywhere, all of the time. That pallet rack is kind of full of my junk. I need to, I need to not do that. And here is one of my inventory racks. We're currently inventorying this 2006 Jeep Commander. It's just a 4.7. It's got a lift kit on it, some fancy wheels and a roof basket. It does run, much to my amazement. Blasted hard in the right front. And another inventory rack. Celica GTS. These cars do really good for me, no matter how many miles are on them or how terrible the stickers are that are on them. Two ZZ six speed manual. Oh, you, you guys actually want to talk about this old RX-7. Well, this is actually a car I plan on working on this year. I've had this car longer than any other car I currently own. It's an 85 light beige RX-7 GS, drum rear brakes. It was a 12A. I bought it with no engine in it. I've test fitted a few things in here. Still not sure what I want to put under the hood. Probably nothing crazy. I don't need to go LS or a 5 liter or anything nuts like that. I just want to be able to drive it. So I'm not sure where this project will go, but this is a rust-free car. It only has 107,000 miles on it. I have a complete GSLSE suspension swap for it. I actually have like two and a half complete swap. So I guess I could sell one if you need one. And I have some 15 inch wheels for it uh, with that 4x114.3 lug pattern that look just like what's on here now. Probably convert the car to power windows. This will be a pretty neat car when I'm done. This is my favorite generation of RX-7. My dad had one growing up. He had a Tornado Silver GSLSE. So I'm going to relive those memories of being 11 years old and getting yelled at for missing the bus. And this is my original Mazda B2200. This is the first Mazda truck I ever had. I've had a few. And this is actually uh, halfway through restoration. It's a completely restored frame with sandblasted, coated, uh, new brakes, new everything, new bushings. It's been gone through front to back. It's got an RX-7 limited slip differential in the live rear axle. And really, I just set the cab and the beds on it to move it here about four years ago. And it hasn't moved since. And it's kind of a shame. This truck at one point in time had an Kia, had a Kia Sportage FE dual overhead cam 2 liter with Mega Squirt. I still have that engine, still have the transmission. So that's probably what's going to go back in it if I ever find the time. Someday. I keep some of my higher end parts cars inside. This is a 2006 M5 with an SMG transmission. I know it's not a six speed manual, but I'd be sad if it was because it's hit too hard to fix. Uh, the car only has 85,000 miles on it. We got the engine to run. We had to put an oil pan on it to do so. I'm actually trying to sell this engine currently, but it's been kind of tough because I require a core on this. I want to do a teardown on an S85 V10 and I refuse to sell an engine where I won't get the old one. Not one of these. So it's been kind of tough to sell, but I'm sure I'll find the right buyer eventually. And another sad story, a 65,000 mile 01 Z3 3 liter manual. Hit too hard in the front to fix. Had some quarter damage thanks to Copart. 
So we are parting this car out currently. The drivetrain is sold. We have lots of other parts on this car. Kind of cool color too. Boston green. And a 97 Corvette. Uh, it's only got two pedals in it, but these part out really well. I buy a lot of C5s, probably six to eight of these cars a year. I tried to buy the manuals, but they're a little harder to find. And this is where all of my Miata parts are. Got everything organized thanks to my inventory manager. Came back here and rearranged everything. I've got everything from Torsen swaps. I've got engines and transmissions in another part of the shop and still some in cars. So if you need anything for your 90 to 2005 Mazda Miata, there's a good chance I've got it. And of course you guys are familiar with the Cobra. I finally got the other side tailpipe in and I will be getting this on the rack very soon. Spring is just around the corner and this car needs to be on the road. Here is another part of my shop that's kind of under construction. This is my back end of Chrysler PCM. Uh, this is where we do a lot of calibration testing and pre-programming, verification that it's good. That's why the Jeep is back here so I can plug computers into it and hear it run. And of course we have lots and lots of inventory and everything in these bins is bad. So many bad Chrysler computers. It's almost like they go bad. And then we get to my teardown area. You guys are very familiar with this part of the shop. This is where all the magic happens. This is actually the dirtiest part of the shop, but we do try to keep it clean. It's actually a big mess right now. I've done a couple teardowns and I haven't had a lot of time to reorganize. Got some open shelf space, but next week I'm going to get another load of engines. So this shelf will be full again. These are some upcoming teardowns an N54. No, we're not tearing that S52 apart. And then another N63 and another 6.2 liter AMG engine. So if you guys need an LS short block, I have plenty. Six liter irons, I have lots of 5.3, both aluminum and iron, all Gen 4 stuff, all 58X stuff. And then I've got rods and pistons and heads. If you need 799s, 243s, 823s, 821s, 53, 64s, I've got all of those heads in stock. We move a ton of this stuff. This is uh, like a revolving door back here. Here is where everything gets palletized. This is my freight shipping department. It's really not much to it. You know, freight scale back here. Yep. Uh-huh. Some tool overflow. And then this is where we do some cylinder head work. We extract broken exhaust manifold bolts from LS heads. We check valves, check for cracks. And here is my parts washer. You guys have seen this also. Some parts waiting to be washed. This thing is running eight hours a day, sometimes longer. Every single day we're open. I'm, I'm about ready to buy a second. Here are my dismantling bays. I've got two of them, two full-time dismantlers. I'd like to get another one in here. Taking apart an 08 Avalanche currently. And then I sold the, well, one of my guys sold the LS4 out of this Monte Carlo SS after just seven days of being inventoried. Maybe we were too cheap. This area is by far the messiest part of the shop, especially this bay right here. There's the LC9 out of that avalanche, which I just found that it has those uh, heat tabs on the back of the cylinder head. So this engine does not, in fact, have 281,000 miles, but I'll never know how many it actually has. Here are the parts that we have that are waiting to be listed on eBay and on our website, eventually on Facebook Marketplace. Got a lot of parts that need to be listed and not enough people to list them. So if you are interested in working here and you'd like to list parts on the internet, there's a job available or four. I'm gonna keep that door open as long as I can. Some more incoming parts. These are parts shipped in from other yards that we buy. Oh yes, that is a dealership Mazda sign. That came from the dealer 
my brother currently works at, the one I got fired from, and the one my dad retired from. And here is the cleanup area where parts get prepped for pictures to get listed. There's my photo booth that I just built. Still got to finish the gray one. We used to have a, just a light gray booth. It just wasn't enough. These new booths, I know this is a lot of red for you guys. These new booths have power in the floor, auto retracting pretty slick, at least. I'm pretty proud of myself. Pat myself on the back later. Here's our connectors. We power a lot of our parts up in the picture so that our customers can see that they work. And we've got all the connectors organized for the common stuff that we get in over and over again. And then, up there is my private stash of parts. This is Eric's hoard up there. There's probably 4,000 pounds worth of parts up there. Sets of wheels and some doors and fenders, stuff that I want to hang on to, stuff off of my own cars. We're just not going to talk about that anymore. So as you can see, this shop is pretty big. 21,000 square foot in this warehouse. But it feels like it's packed. I'm actually looking to maybe buy another piece of property soon, expand. Got 20 people that work here right now and there's not enough room for everyone to park if everybody shows up. And that is a problem. All right, we're walking into my back lot. This is where I keep most of my inventoried cars. Not so much the big trucks. They don't really fit back here that well. Uh, there's my tow rig right there. It's a 12 Silverado 2500 that we put a flatbed on. Imported that one from Oklahoma. Well, Texas, technically. And these are some of my inbound cars. Got an E39 530. That's a 550. Uh, 328 I shouldn't have bought. Hemi Grand Cherokee. Another Miata. An SC430. Another Hemi, no, that's a 3.6 Grand Cherokee, it's a 12, I think. And then this, I'm kind of keeping back here. This is a 535 manual. It's been back here for a while. I'm actually going to use the manual transmission and all of those parts in my E61 wagon to convert my car to two-wheel drive and manual transmission. I know I'm crazy. I shouldn't fix something that's not broke. Uh, got an old SL, well, it's not that old. I think it's a 2000. Another Miata. Another Miata, this is a 1.6 car. I think it's only got 101,000 miles on it. Hey look, another Miata. I know, and the Hemi Charger. It's actually a really nice car. It's pretty, it's a shame that it's wrecked so hard. Let's see if I can get through to this next row. Oh yeah, there's my Fleetwood. I love parting these cars out. I mean, I, I like these cars in general, and I, I don't like killing them, but at the same time, they part out so well. Got a 13 Mustang back there. 335. I think that's a convertible. There's a manual all-wheel drive element. G6 convertible. We're not going to talk about that. And then there's another couple E60s. I think it's a 550. Actually, that's a manual car right there. It's a six-speed. And that is just a 530. Let's see what else we've got. Uh, there's my Porsche Boxster I bought for the transmission to put into my Lotus Esprit at some point. I'll get to that. There's a Monte Carlo SS on the end. Another E60 because they drop like flies. Another Miata. Another 335. 350Z Roadster. Unfortunately, it's an auto. And another SC430. I do lots of SCs. They're really good cars to part out. This is a car that I wish I hadn't bought. It's a Mercedes diesel. Runs and drives good. We'll sell the drivetrain someday. 550 Sport. And uh, let's see, that's a 13 Hemi Charger. Uh, here's a really sad one. This is a Mystic Blue 330 ZHP. I really wanted to save this car, but it was so rough. It's so clapped out. It's got the wrong hood on it. It's a six speed manual car. Uh, it's got 172,000 miles on it. It's got a good drivetrain. It does run and drive, but it's just, it's just rough. There's a Thunder Chicken to some of these cars and another Thunder Chicken next to it. Let's see what else we got back here. 
I haven't walked back here in a while and I know this is kind of messy back here. Don't look at that. There's a uh, an Integra GSR. It's got a B16 in it, I think. Uh, Civic SI, Celica GTS manual. You got a couple of those cars. Another Hemi Charger. Uh, really sad one. E36 M3 with 140,000 miles on it. The car has BC coilovers. It's a manual black on black sedan. Try to keep these interiors nice when we can, but it's not always the case. Another 330. This actually has a bunch of Dynan parts on it. It's got a broken intake, but it's got a Dynan shock tower bar, uh, Dynan software, exhaust, pedals, which doesn't do anything. Another 350Z roaster. This one's a manual. I got the motor sold out of this E46. It's just a 325 manual coupe. Another Miata. And my parts car 928, which I'll get to at some point. And a Z3. I do try to buy as many of those as I can. And then we'll look at some inbound stuff here. It's not inventoried yet. I've got a Land Cruiser with electronic lockers and only 300,000 miles on it. A 335 and a 10 Mustang GT. I think this one is a manual, yes. Now this guy lived, I looked it up. He didn't die. I'm morbid like that, I have to know. But we haven't inventoried this car yet. Here's another Land Cruiser. I did the videos on this one, getting it running. Another Land Cruiser. As you can see, we've done really well parting these out. Uh, this is a 07 Z4M Roadster. That the motor did make it, I know. It's impressive. It did have some broken off bolts in it, but we got all the bolts out. A lot of good parts on that. A six speed 04 GTO. Someone put a 60 hood on it with hood scoops that we've already sold or they were broken. I'm not sure. I sold a lot of parts off of this one. And there's a, another Miata hiding underneath this. And another 328 I shouldn't have bought. This was a tow lot car. What does this say on the window? Don't open me, I get angry. About right let's see what's up front now this is normally much cleaner than this but we just i just crushed cars earlier today still got more to crush this is my crush piles where we get rid of cars when we're done with them i try not to throw away good parts but it inevitably happens it's unfortunate there's my loader my 1904 cat no it's really like a 1980 but it it's old and it leaks everything all the time there's another E34 I'm parting out. If you need anything, guys, let me know. There's a Land Cruiser. It's got a locked up engine, but it does have E lockers on it. Good front and rear axles. O2 Forerunner. It's a three runner, actually. Uh, my first Commander here. I don't buy too many 4.7 trucks, but this is a 4.7. It's got a lift, cool basket. Not inventoried yet. We'll get to it soon. These N2 BMWs is like this 07, I think, maybe it's an 08 X3. It's actually a pretty decent vehicle. Came from a tow lot, it was abandoned. I think I'm gonna save this one. I don't like putting good cars down. It doesn't start, I haven't figured out why, but it could be something really minor. I'll dig into it. And then this is another one. This is an 04 525 Sport Package. Might do a video on getting this thing started. Another tow lot car that was abandoned. Probably needs an MPM, which is the microprocessor module in the trunk to get wet and then the fuel pump doesn't turn on. There's an LLY truck. Parting that one out, it's inventory. There's another LLY truck. This one's got less than 200,000 miles on it, which is pretty low for one. Got a Dodge Ram 59 that was very difficult to get in because it's only got two wheels on it and of course they're on the same side. There's an, I think it's an 04 Z71, might be an 03. It's a pretty decent truck. Unfortunately, it's got a little rust. came from Indy. And this is the rustiest 06 Tahoe that has ever existed. We've got an Avalanche. We've got an O2 Escapade. A Cummins truck. This thing runs really good. A Yukon that's wrecked and has low oil pressure. Yeah, see, just because the truck's wrecked doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's got a good engine. Another wrecked 5.3 two-wheel drive truck. Hemi Grand Cherokee, do a lot of those. Do really well for me. This is a 750 I picked up for a few hundred bucks to keep it out of the scrapyard. I'll probably end up parting this thing out. It does not have a limited slip, but it is a rare, it's a 94, has HIDs, inlaid trim, 
lots of good parts just probably not worth straightening out it's unfortunate and then this is a i think it's a 10 so we're out of 2500 i think i'm gonna build this truck these are really easy trucks to fix and i have half the parts already to do so there's the tundra from an earlier video and yes another mystic this car's gonna be for sale pretty soon i don't want to part it out it's a clean title run and drive and that's the only damage on the car it does have 170 some odd thousand miles yes it needs a door and a fender yeah 179 I just hate seeing good cars go to waste and some more inbound stuff this stuff hasn't been inventoried yet even though we did sell the rear end out of this another land cruiser it's the worst condition one i've ever had it's another land cruiser this one's got lockers on it it's supposed to have a good engine the the uh transport company that hired that i hired to bring this thing from chicago here dropped it and let it roll through my gate and then denied any wrongdoing in it whatsoever they said oh it's got no brakes you're supposed to know that well it's an auction car and here's a 135 convertible that's going to be inside and inventoried really soon that thing's been here for too long another sc430 an sl550 i think it's an 07 another 535 we're running out of cars to show you guys and this is a heavy magnum i'm actually going to fix this car i know i know boo hiss boo hiss but it's a really nice car it really doesn't have a lot of body damage one little dent on the rear quarter needs some proper wheels on it but it has a broken control arm it needs left front suspension and i have all of that here and here is a trailblazer ss that was run through the auction as an ls and i got a good deal on it hopefully the engine survived but i i'm not banking on it at all and a bullet mustang like i said i buy the cool versions of normal cars and then last and probably least it's my 4.6 is x5 i know better than to fix this car so i'm not going to i'm instead i'm going to use the engine i'm going to build the engine for one of my e34s that's the best use of that engine now, about my video actually about the name of my channel and i know i've covered this in some really old videos but i want to talk about why my channel is called i do cars and that is because there is a super awkward questions that us americans like to ask each other and that is well what do you do so on a normal person or a normal person would react oh i'm a doctor or i'm a lawyer or you know my wife i'm a nurse or you know i work at a bank okay well when i get asked that question what do i say well uh, I'm self-employed. Well, that sounds like I don't have a job or I run my own business. Okay. So I sell things out of the back of a van. None of, the, none of those options are very good. But if I say, oh, I take cars apart and I sell car parts on eBay, I park cars out, I rebuild car parts. I work on my own cars. I fix a few cars and sell them every year. Well, how do you say that without saying all of that? So I just said, well, I do cars. I mean, I, I do as much with cars as I possibly could. I love them. I think that's been pretty apparent in my videos. Finding the time to shoot video is probably the hardest part of this channel. You know, I can't do it during normal business hours. I've got too much going on and there are also 20 people that work here. The shop is never quiet enough to do that during the day. I also let my guys stay late and work on their own cars at night and sometimes on the weekend. So finding a time that no one else is at the shop is pretty difficult. I usually come in after my son goes down one night during the week, 8.30, 9 o'clock, and I'll shoot a teardown till like 1 or 2 in the morning. If it's a very difficult teardown like that OM642 or the Duramax, I'll come in two nights. I'll film part of it on one day, part of it the next night. Uh, I don't change my clothes in the middle of a teardown. It's just the next day. And then I'll edit it Saturday morning or Friday night and get a video up. I know that sounds ridiculous. And yes, I do have a B-roll of stuff in case I get sick and I can't have a teardown done that week. So I've got something to lean back on, but there's just a lot that goes on. And I get a lot of questions on how long it takes to shoot one of these videos. So if I shoot an LS teardown, that's like the standard for comparison. Let's do like a normal 5.3. It takes about two and a half, maybe three hours, start to finish to film one of those teardowns. Now, if I have one of those engines and there's no camera involved, 25 minutes, I'm holding the crankshaft in my hands. 
but the camera adds a lot. You gotta set your camera angles, the lighting, you have to adjust all of the settings on your camera and your mic, make sure everything's good, and that's every time you move the camera. So there's a lot that goes into it, and I, I don't mean to sound like I'm complaining, I just wanted to explain how that process works. There are some things I'd like to change about this channel going forward, but before I do that, I'd like to talk about the things that will never change. And I read all of the comments, and I see lots of, that's a, a common theme amongst those comments, like, thanks for not playing cheesy, crappy music, or thanks for not having an intro. I like my videos to get right to the point. I model my content off of what I like to watch. And it's more work for me to slide an intro in there, build an intro, find some music that I am not that happy with, and, and I play guitar, and I kind of, in the early days, thought I'd have some theme music that I wrote myself, but it's just not worth it. I'll just keep my videos the way they are. There's nothing wrong with it. If it ain't broke, I'm not gonna fix it. Now, as far as the editing is concerned, I edit everything myself. I do all of this. There's no one else involved in this channel just yet. At some point, that may change. I'd, I'd, I'd hate to admit this, but I am running out of time. I don't have enough time. And, you know, a lot of people want a time machine to go back in time. I want a time machine to create more time now. And since that's not reality, uh, it's likely that I'll have to partner up with someone or hire someone to edit my videos. And I am very concerned that it'll lose the way the videos feel. I want my videos to be consistent, and the way they're going right now seems to work pretty well. It's about time you guys met my family. This is my wife, Megan. Hi. This is, this is my son, Griffin. He's just over two years old. And I have a, we have a very important announcement to make. I think you guys are gonna be quite happy for me. I bought another car. I know you guys are all shocked, but <laughs> I know you're shocked. So of course, I didn't need any other cars. But, you know, like a kid in a candy store, something popped up. And, you know, who am I to say no to the most ridiculous Mercedes from the mid-2000s? Of course, it's got problems, but the nice thing about it is not only does it fit Griffin. Hey, bud. It's Griffin. Okay. It also fits. Baby number two. <laughs> All right, here it is. This is what you get. Well, this is what I got. I, I still don't know how this is happening now or ever, but it is. So we're gonna open this up. I've saved this for you guys. Is this a pizza box? There's a letter. It says, do you remember your first subscriber, your hundredth or your thousandth? Chances are you do. And we know that you definitely remember your 100,000th subscriber. Your fans may have found you while searching YouTube learned about you through a friend, or maybe you showed up as a recommended video. No matter how they came to your channel, fans stayed and their numbers increased because of your unique voice and the excitement of being part of a growing community that you established. We are thrilled to see the development of your community and are proud to honor your impressive milestone of reaching 100,000 subscribers with the Silver Creator Award. Congratulations. We know that you have many more stories to share with your community and we know that your fans can't wait for you to engage and amaze them even more with your commitment and creativity. So keep creating, keep, keep building, I can't talk. We can't wait to see what you'll do next and we're here to support you along the way. And who knows, when you reach your millionth subscriber, we may just write to you and ask, do you remember your 100,000th subscriber? Sincerely, yours. Yours sincerely. Susan with the last name I can't pronounce. I'm sorry, I don't want to murder that, but this is it. Wow, this is a lot heavier than I anticipated. This is awesome. Wow. This is, I, I never thought this would happen, ever. So, so thank you. Thank you.